ask you to share in the scripture reading with me this morning. This is just two verses from the second chapter of the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to Colossians. So if you would read those two verses with me, please. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Okay, we're going to continue to work on that. When I say this is the word of God for the people of God, our response is thanks be to God. Okay. I'll give you one more week. <laughs> Let's pray together. And Lord, now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together, be pleasing in thy sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So th this has been one of those weeks. You ever had one of those weeks where we had no water, and then we had no internet and no telephone because the lines were cut, and then we had no network server because the computers went down, and then this morning we had no sound up until literally one minute before worship. Uh, so I did my best today and this week to do no harm <laughs> and to try to do good. I hope that you have uh, been successful with me, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that as our worship continues. So we're in the midst of talking about three simple reminders. Two weeks ago we discovered John Wesley's first general rule for the Methodist societies. You remember what it is with me? Do no harm. And Bishop Job reminded us in his book, he said, to do no harm means that I will be on guard so that in all my actions and even in my silence I will not add injury to another of God's children or to any part of God's creation. And I hope that we're being continually attentive to doing what the bishop suggests. Now last week, we reflected together on Wesley's second general rule, and that is to do, do good. And Bishop Job continued to challenge us when he said these words, just when we thought we were ready and to buy into the idea of not doing any harm to anyone or anything, we're faced with an even more difficult choice, and that choice of ours is each and every day, moment by moment, to try to do good. Wesley advocated that the Methodist be about doing as much good as possible in every circumstance of life to as many persons as was possible. He taught us to do good, if you wrote in last week, uh, to their bodies by giving food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, visiting, helping those that are sick or in prison. He further taught the Methodists that were to do good to their souls by instructing, reproving, or exhorting everyone that we have a relationship with. So to do tangible good things to persons and to do spiritual things to help people in their walk of faith. Now several have responded to my challenge this week about doing good. And I want to share with you, I'm sure there are lots more, but I want to share with you some of the stories that were shared with me, either via text or Facebook or email or in some way. One saint among us encountered, I, I just laughed when I read this because we've all had this happen to us. They encountered stuck together carts at Menards. Do I have a witness? And that person said, rather than fuss and fume about that situation, which might be our initial inclination, right? This person took the time to remember what we talked about last Sunday, disengaged several of the carts, and used it as an opportunity, one person at a time, to give a shopping cart to the stream of customers that was coming into Menards. Wonderful. Another saint among us this week bought a birthday gift for a lonely elderly gentleman who likely would not have received a birthday present. 
Still another person took some stressed out colleagues to lunch and continued doing good by intentionally smiling and greeting people, opening doors for others, not tailgating, and letting others go before them in traffic. Delightful. One among us took the time to escort a family member to a sporting event who had not been able to attend for a while and probably would not have been able to go without some help. Another had a friend who commented on a recipe that they posted on Facebook, and so this person made it for them and took it over to their friend to share it with them. I wish that had been me, but it wasn't. <laughs> Somebody among us mowed their neighbor's grass and cleaned up tree branches. Somebody among us didn't run over someone in a golf cart who stopped suddenly and didn't even think or say a bad word in the process. And that, those two people are actually present among us this morning. I'll, I'll let those of you amuse about who that might be. A, a lengthy and delightful post that came to me yesterday evening about our community and church helping a young man in our high school who has had, shall we say, a very difficult life journey. Money given to grade school for kids who don't have dollars for milk or for lunch. That happened this week. One of our men mentoring another man and encouraging him, I guess you could kind of say getting in his face a little bit about attending church. And lastly, several I'm sure have written notes and sent stamps to Twangy Smith's son, Hassani, uh, me being among those. And I'm glad for all of these and so many other stories, I'm sure, that we could share about doing good. Thank you for that. Hope that we continue to do good. So to first, do no harm, and to secondly, do good. If you're writing in your sermon notes this morning, they're on the back of your announcements sheet. To do those things are two tangible practices in the life of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Wesley called these works of mercy. Would you say that with me? Works of mercy. Works of mercy, beloved, are those things that we do on behalf of someone else. They're not for us. They're something that we do as we give our heart away to other people. Here's some examples of works of mercy. Giving away money or material goods to support feeding and clothing ministries, the sweat of our brow in uh, working not for ourselves but on behalf of others. Mercy is investing ourselves in the well-being of others, seeking the best in them, investing ourselves in teaching and admonishing and encouraging and loving other people, works of mercy for the Methodist societies and in the life of every Christian. In other words, you and me works of mercy, those things that we do on behalf of somebody else. Please keep that up. It's absolutely wonderful Christian behavior for us. Wesley also taught us about works of piety. This next slide. Piety means religious devotion and reverence to God. In other words, staying in love with God. Say that with me. Staying in love with God. Piety is that which we internalize in our relationship with God. Mercy is that way, outward. Piety is this way, inward. Just do that with me to help us to remember. Mercy is outward. Piety is inward. Piety is that which I do for myself. King David said in Psalm 105, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Do you hear the language of journey in there? Seeking. It's active. St. Paul encouraged the church at Colossae and said, read with me, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. There's some commonality in these passages, and the commonality is connection. So in order to progress in our faith, to be faithfully pious and to fulfill John Wesley's mandate to be involved in works of mercy, which is the outward part, we must attend to our personal connection with God. 
You remember a few years back, the popular cell phone provider used the expression, can you hear me now? Remember? It was a way, I think, of touting the reliability of their network. That commercial would have led us to believe that we would have cell service in whatever obscure place that we might choose to make a call. I can remember those days. Well, first of all, I can remember the days when we didn't have cell phones. I can remember going out on Sunday afternoons for a drive in the automobile. I was just talking about that with someone this weekend. And what would we have done had we had car trouble? I guess you flagged somebody else down. I don't remember but it was kind of blissful in a way that we weren't texting with anyone. We weren't being interrupted by telephone calls. We had time for each other in those conversations. Now, I'm not advocating you leave your phone at home, but it's a thought. Whether or not you're a fan of that particular cell phone provider, you've undoubtedly experienced with me this frustration. I experience it with some of you sometimes. Where we're in conversations, and, and you will simply be dropped from the call. We go between cell towers. We go to a, a dead zone, so to speak. And those are, are very unfortunate incidents because we're right in the middle of some kind of important conversation and those calls get dropped. I wish sometimes that you and I were as passionate about the connection that we have with the Almighty as we are with our cellular service. Laurel and I had the opportunity this week it was fun to take the Amtrak into the city and to go play and do some fun things to celebrate our anniversary. And I don't think there was a person on that train, us included, that didn't have their face in their phones. We were passionate about those devices, aren't we? And we simply, you and I, will not put up with marginal cell phone service because our conversations with our loved ones and our friends and our business dealings by phone and other important things like Angry Birds or Candy Crush that some, I think, are involved in are important to us. Can I ask us a spiritual question? How is our connection with the Almighty today. Paul says, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live with him. It's not a once and done deal. As I frequently say to confirmands when we have those kinds of conversations, as those young people are coming into the church, this is not a hoop, this is not a check mark in the box. You are not finished. This is a relationship that you have with the Almighty that requires constant connection. In other words, from the moment that you first fell in love with him, keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. John Wesley would ask us the question this morning if he were in private conversation with us, how is it with your soul? There's a Christian songwriter, some of you know him by uh, the name of Lanny Wolf, who several years ago wrote a song that testified about his uh, love for Jesus. An interesting thing about Lanny Wolf is he's a, a graduate of Southern Illinois University Carbondale Music School, like me. But Lanny wrote these words of the song When I first fell in love with Jesus, I gave him all my heart. I thought I couldn't love him more than I did right at the start. But now I look back over the mountains and valleys where I've been, and it makes me know I love him so much more than I did. And then he comes to that chorus, and maybe you'll remember it I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Do you know it? I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. That's our call as disciples. And sometimes our journey from the beginning, we'd like to think, is kind of like the scientific graph that just sort of makes a gradual ascension. But sometimes that journey, beloved, kind of goes along like this, and then it doubles back, and it dives down, and climbs back up again. It's not always clean. It's not always pretty. Sometimes we do fall out of love with him. So the greater question 
The important question is how do we stay in love with him? How do we stay in love with God? This was Paul's suggestion. Continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. God desires that we stay in love with him. I can tell you from many, many years of experience that God doesn't fall out of love with us. Never. It's you and I who veer away from his presence and his faithfulness. The liturgy of our church says we err and stray from him like lost sheep. David testifies in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Can you read these words with me? Slide number 7. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself faithful blameless. David reminds you and me that God is faithful. So the question for you and me is this one, are we faithful? Are we faithful to endeavor to stay in love with him? This has been my learning through many years of of walking with Christ. God does not force himself on us. God waits patiently and yearningly and lovingly for us to come home to sit at his feet in his presence. God longs for us to be in relationship with himself like a parent who longs for that visit, who longs for that call of a wayward child. And I think of that story in Luke's gospel of the prodigal or the loving father, as some have called it, where he's waiting patiently and pacing the porch for that wayward child to come home. Such is God's love towards you and me. So how do we then stay in love with God? Wesley outlined it carefully for the Methodist societies, and we would be one of those. He said this, by attending upon the ordinances of God. Now don't let that word scare you too much. Ordinance simply means practice. Can you say that with me? Practice. And I think, as I learned as a child, practice makes... Okay. So if we practice these things, then maybe we will progress in our journey of faith. And as Methodists, we call that sanctification, moving on towards perfection. So what are the practices? Here they are. The public worship of God, the ministry of the word, be it read or expounded, personal time alone in the scriptures, the supper of the Lord, and family or private prayer. Let's begin here. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, the scripture teaches. You and I need to be in church. I grew up in an era era where church was about the only thing that was going on in community. So if, if you went to a skating party, it was held at the church. If you went to a youth group activity, it was held at the church. If there was a meal happening in the community, it was happening at the church. Our culture has shifted. Lots of wonderful things still happen at the church, but lots of wonderful things are happening in other places as well in our communities. We have to make church a choice. This is the way I like to say it. We need to be in church more often than we're not in church. Let the church say amen. I didn't hear you. We have a choice, don't we? The ministry of the word, be it read or expounded. There's power in the spoken word. You notice each week that I encourage us to participate in the reading of the scripture. There's power in our speaking those words together. And each week after the scripture, we say these words and we remember our response. I'm going to ask you to do this, so I'm prompting you now. This is the word of God for the people of God. We're we're learning. We're learning. Wesley advocated that the scriptures be preached. But Wesley also advocated that we take time alone with our holy scriptures. That's hard. We wake up and we're busy. Some people wake up and say, Oh Lord, it's morning. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we woke up and said, Good morning, Lord. And then find some time 
in the morning or at midday or if it works for us in the evening. Some people tell me it works for them right before they go to bed. Whenever it works for you to spend some time alone in the scriptures. Even if it's just a verse, beloved. Even if it's just a verse or two by using the, the little devotional that we have out on the table, out in the welcome center area, the upper room it's called. A plethora of online resources that you can subscribe to, radio broadcasts, sitting quietly in your chair, going out by a, uh, a lake someplace and turning off everything for a little bit and listening to the still sweet voice of the Spirit. God yearns for us to be daily in communication with him. Wesley also advocated regular communion, the Supper of the Lord, and we participate in that monthly. He stressed family and private prayer. He also advocated searching the scriptures and fasting or abstinence, and sometimes we do that especially in times such as Lent. These are all works of piety, not mercy, piety, that which we do for ourselves to grow in Christ. Spiritual practices that we maintain that help us in the connection between ourselves and our gracious God. Laurel and I have a dear friend that lives in Wichita, Kansas. Her name is Allison. And a while back I asked Allison, would you share a testimony with me? She's a wonderful Christian pilgrim. Would you share, Allison, a testimony with us about how that you have stayed in love with God? And let me just read to you what she wrote in response to my question. She said, Mike, you stay in love with Jesus the same way you stay in love with anyone. And then she spoke to me personally, and she said, how have you stayed in love with Laurel all these years? When I think back about how Jesus came to me in that movie theater 35 years ago, and it would be a little longer now, that that was him loving me enough to come and not only tell me, but he came in a way that was special and unique to him and me. And over the years... We have built a history together, some of which people know about and a lot of which only just the two of us know, she wrote. But isn't that just the same with you and your spouse who've been together for a long time? Sometimes we have fought. He always wins those arguments, she wrote. Sometimes we talk about, sometimes we don't have too much to say. Sometimes the crises are massive. Sometimes the work is just that and we get really busy together. But the point is... We have shared 35 years of life together, Jesus and me. And let me say this, I think about what makes the difference between my relationship with him and a lot of other people's is. And I just love this part. Listen very carefully to what Alice, Allison says. I believe that what his word says is as if he were telling it to me personally. So can you imagine Reading John 3.16 and inserting your name in there. For God so loved Mike. That's what Allison is saying. I believe she said that when I pray, I am directly, personally, and tangibly, experientially in his presence. In other words, I am talking to him about whatever the issue is, just as if I were talking to any of you face to face. And when I'm on my knees or my head is bowed or whatever, I have no trouble whatsoever in imagining myself before his throne and seeing him inclining his whole body, his self towards me to hear what I'm saying. As Psalm 1835 says, you stoop down to make me great. I just love that. It's personal. And that's how we grow in our relationship with him. And that's how we stay in a growing relationship with him. I invite you to remember with me an important conversation that Jesus had with one of his followers. We find it recorded in John chapter 21, three times in that conversation, Jesus says to Peter these words, Do you love me? Oh, it's a frustrating conversation for Peter. But it's an instructive conversation for anyone who wants to be an effective disciple for Jesus Christ. Why? Because if we're to be engaged in the ministry of healing, 
and helping in the name of Jesus. If we're to be involved in the works of mercy, friends, extending cups of cold water in his name as acts of mercy, you and I have to first be in love with Jesus. And so that's the question that Jesus asks Peter over and again. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. <clears throat> if you love me, then Jesus went on to say, feed my lambs. Read in that scripture this afternoon, John 21. And then he says to him, do you love me? Of course, Lord, I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Another act of mercy. So the conversation continued ultimately with this challenge. Feed my sheep and ultimately follow me. His servant relationship with Jesus was primarily connected to his personal love relationship with Jesus. His outward acts of mercy were personally connected to his spiritual life with God. And so is ours. Bishop Job writes in his book these words, staying in love with God was the primary issue of faithful life then and it is today. For from such a life of God will flow the goodness and love of God to the world. It can't be any other way. So Bishop Job challenges our thinking today just like Jesus challenged Peter's thinking. He writes and says, Holy living will not be discovered, achieved, continued, or sustained without staying in love with God. Wesley was accurate in saying that to love God means prayer, worship, study, and the Lord's Supper. And it also means serving others by doing good. So as we wrap this up today, I hope that the church will remember these words. Do know, do, and stay in love with. Let's pray together. Father, help us as church to follow the mandate that you have given us to stay in love with you. And because of that love and because of that growing relationship, that personal relationship that we have with you, may deeds of goodness simply overflow from us like streams of living water to a broken and hurting world. May these become for us not things that we even have to think about, but just a life of serving you that comes from transformed hearts each and every day. We pray that this may be a church that is in love with you and that those deeds of mercy that overflow from that love for you will be known to all. This is our prayer. And we pray it in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said.